dating men is not a privilege <laughs> because have you met many? <laughs> you know? No, no, to my to my lovely uh, uh, straight friends out there praying for you. Hey there, everybody. I uh, hope I am transmitting to you in good tidings. I know that I am especially stoked to be bringing you this episode of Library Hours. It features a dear friend, an absolute genius. Poet Muriel Young is the author of the book Imagine Us the Swarm, which just got released by Nightboat Books. You may also know Muriel through her other books, Bone Confetti and Images Seen to Images Felt. Or maybe you read her works in other publications like The Baffler, Cream City Review, Collegist, Fairy Tale Review. She's a Pushcart Prize nominated writer, and she's here to talk to us about her stuff, but also to talk to me about an author she introduced me to, Carmen Maria Machado. We're going to talk about the short story The Husband's Ditch from Machado's Her Body and Other Parties. I've been seeing it online, a growing response to her work over the last few years, and I'm so excited to talk about it. If you haven't read the book yet, don't worry, it's a collection of short stories, so you can listen in on this one and then read the rest of it, you won't be spoiled. If you like it, uh, then go to your nearest book uh, dealership and, and pick it up along with Muriel's Imagine Us the Swarm. She's gonna do a reading for us up top, and I, I'm just so excited, I'm, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get into it. Let's go. I was very taken immediately with your work because you've always been uh, very open with me and and uh, and including me. Like uh, you, you took me to some 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 really fantastic readings in downtown Los Angeles, and I felt so I was like, oh, my hipness has gone up by like at least fifteen percent, mm-hmm. and not in that fake hipness either. Like these are people who actually have things to say and and people around them who want to listen. And <laughs> and I, I just uh, I know I, I always feel like I I, I don't know I have twelve years in the city, and I still always feel like the bumpkin who just fell off the turnip truck whenever I'm around artists <laughs> of real depth <laughs> with with because I, I don't always feel like I'm always doing the things that are uh have like the perspective that is as needed in America right now <laughs> say other voices that you've introduced I don't me know to. <laughs> I just watched you take like a testosterone shot like on stage you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah one oh time God. one time I you know I, I, I've done that a couple of times now uh Muriel was very nice to come out and, and watch me perform yeah I do just yeah love your drag persona um so much because it is just wonderfully messy <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, no, that's probably the best but it's messy I want I want to know more about like uh what is it like for you when you when you do your readings do you do you get stage fright or at this point it's like lecturing or doing readings just kind of like something you you're, you've settled into in your in your profession oh Oh, wait, so are we are we recording right now? But yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is, we're already into it. That's why that's why I want to make sure I'm getting it back on you and not talking about my my stupid drag stuff too much. <laughs> uh, no, it's not stupid. I love it. Um, I think it's all part of. I mean, we're talking about performance. We're talking about art making, and we're talking about um, gender, which is very much what you know. A lot of like my my recent book is about i haven't gotten a chance to read it yet i'm very excited yeah i mean it, it's so this this forthcoming book is imagine it's called imagine us to swarm and it's from nightboat books um which has an amazing catalog of qd bipoc um folks authors should so i highly encourage everyone to check it out um and this book kind of came at uh follows my first book which is called bone confetti and mm-hmm. it was just it started off as just sort of reflecting on um, what it, the process of writing a book was like, and especially because that first book was so much about uh, painting this really speculative landscape of grief. And I was just talking about a lot of things using this like highly figurative language. And I wrote it at a time when I was, you know, in my MFA program in Louisiana. Um, and I just, I think I wanted to write about identity in this way where people couldn't um, pick it apart in the way that I think a lot of times like white audiences like want to find like these what they think are legible racialized objects, you know, mm-hmm. and I think yeah, I was yeah, yeah. protecting myself in a lot of ways. I didn't want to share elements of my my like my biography, my family history. I just felt like it wasn't a safe space to do that. And so I think I do believe that you know, speculative genre, you know, imagining other worlds. Like it's a really powerful move and I still stand by the book, but it also left a lot of things that, you know, hadn't been excavated. And so um, the writing that came after the first book was very much just reflecting on the process of writing. What does it mean to write about one's personal familial history in this way that acknowledges that a lot of it isn't perfect, but there's also this 
burden of representation that comes with being Asian American, um, a woman, in my case, a cis woman, and how I think about our my gendered history um, in relationship to like other Asian American women, femmes, non-binary folks who've been read as femmes. You know, I I think it's about for me, it's it's been about trying to forge a different kind of conversation in which we're looking at this history and not just saying and not, not assigning um, characters who are bad or good, but looking at the various ways in which historical violence um, and political violence has structured the way that we relate to each other and to have compassion, enough compassion for the people we choose to have compassion for. Um, but to also want something different for ourselves and and, and so and for so to talk about trauma in this way where it's not mutually exclusive from mm. from um, thinking about like a future of healing of um, you know learning being curious about um, these things that make up our complicated history on on a sort of like broader social level, but also you know our my personal familial history, which is full of you know <laughs> bad actors. You know I think like a lot of this writing is very cerebral. It's it's there's there's a lot of um, blended essay poetic forms. It's a lot of the work is really hybrid, and I think it that sort of messiness of it is is the product of just like having all these remaining questions. Um, over the years, which is like, what do you do? You know, what what is your responsibility as a writer? What is your responsibility to the world um, in in your um, current social position? Um, and so I thought about mine a lot, you know, as an Asian American cis woman who's queer, you know, who's who's a survivor, who has witnessed like different, you know, types of violence you know, in my life um, and hoping that in some ways like this literary form can do justice to that. Uh, you know, as I was fortunate enough to to have read excerpts and stuff from Bone Confetti, you, you know who it reminded me kind of of, not necessarily in content or even form, but in that sort of, uh, uh, is David Lynch's, he started out as like an impressionistic painter in his college days and they kind of like went over into film from there. But I really, I really connect to, to artists like you and him where you lay out these images uh, that are very concrete and, and mean something very specific to you. But you, like you said, you weren't necessarily interested in holding my hands or giving me clear, concise answers to what it was. You were just saying, here are the things uh, I, I, you know, I hope it elicits this emotion from you. Is there, is there any piece that you would uh, be what, like a small thing to, to reach to us? Cause I'm, I'm just so excited. And I, and I know uh, a lot of my other listeners also uh, are, are into, into poetry as well. And so I, I just wanted to <laughs> take the, take the opportunity if, if you if you're in the mood to do one <laughs> yeah i will read um so the the book is um uh comprised of different um i call them essays and verse you know mm -hmm. so there's different sections and there's a final section which is just a series of poems that i think begin with the same um refrain which is suppose um and so each of these poems in a way is kind of like reimagining a different type of future, reimagining a past wrong or past harm, and just kind of like running with the speculative theme of just trying to imagine something different. And so this is one of the poems um, from that final section, and it has no title. Suppose the impact was a bell, a warning instead moving through a hollow factory. The violence of men and the colonial rituals of their past were a lesson. In the pedagogy of grief, the earth was good, and then history, the stalwart chemicals of its wake, still seeps in the soil. Would we not reverse that too, if we could? The atomic weight of him pressed so deep into my torso that generations after would feel the soreness of ribs. Suppose my grandfather never struck my aunt because her cheek was there and my father, in his piety to the self-same heaving, did not instead tell her to move out of the way. Because I was born witnessing and in my queerness still desire the love of these masculine injuries, I listened too closely and was lost. 
the pattern undulates and recedes. Suppose I became the sound of wind chimes crashing into the ground, startling the other body there that would not move. The ghost of my future visits my past and tells her, you have to be brave. I could fortify my life this way. My allegiance to the bone, its refusal as instruction, will buoy me when memory is not enough. To feel even now the soft impressions of many thumbs. They are not the violence I remember. There is nothing left to forgive. Oh, just just a gorgeous stuff. Oh gosh. Uh, and I think I think it's your ability to to draw these 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 metaphors that just are and in, 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 and then just go straight into very explicit uh, lines and stuff. I think that is the dance and the rhythm that attracts me so much is it, it, it very much uh feels like in and out of a dream in some ways you know like a daydream uh that is not mine uh but i'm very i'm very fortunate to witness <laughs> so thank you for that uh god your your work's so lovely muriel <laughs> yeah. uh and besides besides you know sharing of yourself so much you also uh, another another reason I, I wanted to bring you on is I could also talk about uh, one of the first books that you that you ever recommended to me. You even gave me your copy. It still it still has somebody had, had, had written an inscription to you. Uh, so I need to get that back to you at some point. I wanted to let you know I did not lose your book. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a signed copy from Carmen Maria Machado herself. Oh, so. are you kidding? Okay, I wasn't sure if it was from her. I didn't want to assume her if it was a gifted <laughs> thing. Oh, but now you know Car Carmen Maria Machado. If you ever hear this, first of all. You gotta be friends with Muriel. Uh, you two are geniuses and would have a, 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 a gay old time if you're not already close. Uh, but but second of all, uh, yeah, her her work is is it, uh, she her right? Uh, just yes, yes. just a devastatingly uh, amazing author. Uh, her body and other parties is the book that you, that you lent to me. And uh, you, you told me like, you have to read this first one, uh, The Husband's Stitch, it's based on uh, children's books, right? I think is, is was what that the green ribbon uh, metaphor comes from originally, right? Yeah, I looked it up. I, I think it's called a, In a Dark, Dark Room and Other Scary Stories. And yeah, it's like one of those ones yeah. that has like the creepy macabre sort of gothic uh, illustrations and stuff. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think, you know, given like, I, I mean, like, I feel like children these days are exposed to like far, like more terrifying content. But for for like, I remember growing up, and this was like a terrifying book to read, but in a way that was like, also like very, um, I don't know, it, it was like, it, it had like literary intrigue, too. So I don't think they like make like writing like this anymore for children but there's like definitely other media that are um <laughs> terrifying but yeah it's it's the husband stitch is um one of my favorite short stories in um in carmen maria machado's um book her body and other parties and it is based on the green ribbon which if you're not familiar with um the story um from the original uh, book in the dark dark room it starts off with this girl named Jenny who had this great green ribbon tied around her neck and she's just seemingly like you know your average girl and she meets you know she meets a man and um they marry and you know have this like conventional romance and throughout their marriage you know he he asked and courtship he asked her repeatedly you know like can you take off your ribbon can you take off your ribbon and she you know tells him he can't you know and he keeps asking until finally you know um they're wed you know they they've had you know their you know like several years into marriage and finally she takes off her ribbon and her head rolls off and yeah it's like and when you're a kid that is horrifying that is like because you're not even sure how the human anatomy works you're like what's going on it just rolls off okay <laughs> yeah and i was just like i remember just reading that when i was younger and i was just like thinking about that man i was just like dude why did you have to do that mm -hmm. you know like she told you you know like she didn't have to specify you know she you know made it pretty clear like she didn't want to and you kind of asked for it you know yeah and yeah. um and and so that that story kind of uh, you know under and that you know 
there's there's obviously like very complex layers to that and that i don't think i recognized as, as a child but definitely in you know um machado's uh, story the husband's ditch you know takes it to it's like feminist extreme where it has that speculative premise you know there's there's the na- the narrator is um, a woman with a green ribbon around her neck and uh, very much in the same way as the original story you know meets a man and it's you know um, definitely a more rated R version of that story no the sensuality and the raw sexuality uh, that just gets woven into it, you know, very much like a like a ribbon around around uh, our own neck, it, you know, in the, in this universe. Uh, it, it seems to be only the women, you know, at one point when she gives birth to her son, uh, she's, you know, she weeps because she's happy he does not have one. So I, I don't know for sure, uh, but I do know, you know, this this ends up being like, a, a, you know, she, she meets that person in the, in the figure drawing class who has one, uh, this very, uh, this very uh, is oblique word the, the right word or you know concrete uh, metaphor of of something about somebody uh, that is a you know just an unknowable part to to uh, to the self uh, to others you know it's just like something that is not for the you know for the consumption or you know to be experienced uh, or to be demanded or expected uh, from the partner and I and I, and I love I, I love that that that's what gets grappled with even in uh, an otherwise healthy relationship, you know, he- healthy in, in big, you know, quotes. <laughs> when we think about like true horror or terror, it's like, it's not necessarily always the most obvious monster, right? It is just, mm. just a relationship that's being portrayed in the short story is like, you know, on the outside, like a very conventional hetero seeming romance, you know, where, you know, they marry and they have like, you know, a very active sex life, you know, they're both attracted to each other. And, you know, from the narrator's point of view, you know, is like a very sexual person who is like turned on by the husband. And it's just these moments in which he ask like something of her that she can't offer because it comes at the expense of her life you know yeah, is yeah. is something that um he wouldn't let go and so there's this sort of quiet you know violence to it too where he wants to know because he believes that no women should have any secret from their husbands and i think it's just that that sort of patriarchal misogynist like undertone of it where it's like okay it it reminds me of you know men these days who are like well I never I would never hit a woman you know I would never you know like I I, like you know the other men who do this are cowards and it's like not realizing that you know the very forces that contribute to like abusive behavior or, or harmful behavior even you know like doesn't always have to escalate to that level for it to be something of concern it's actually these these things that happen in these quiet moments in the room alone where you know you you do something you 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 make a demand that um over and over that creates this level of uncertainty in in someone's life who has less power than you and it it has this way of carrying it carrying throughout the years and so you kind of see that sort of psychological pull on the narrator and I think it's just so the, the green ribbon is such a like a compelling stand-in for something that feels I think so familiar um for all of us who who have our green ribbons I mean do you do you feel like you were thinking about your green ribbon I think it, I think it's very impossible not to because you know and uh everything that you that you're saying makes so much sense to me of like we can even decenter, you know, he, you know, hetero, heteronormative relationships and even think about like just in, you know, all of our sort of like interpersonal intimate relationships or friendships or even our, you know, our, our wider community groups, the way that the part of ourselves that we selfishly, but not even in, in, a, in a bad way, uh, define ourselves uh, uniquely and the way you know what we, how that carries into our our public you know like you know the public life and you know in that way of like who we are seeing and interacting with uh, I loved the examples of like when she 
uh, she her son gets the, the 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 starring role in a play, and she she and the and some of the other mothers are sewing, and there's another woman who has a ribbon that's like uh, connected to her fingers, and you know, it, and I was like trying to be like, uh, you know, just in that spe- speculative way of like it could be anything, but I was like, oh, is that even something around around like class or able bodied uh, or some sort of uh, of privilege like part of that sort of access where like that woman was was uh, even more um, curtailed by her her ribbon because it was like tangled up in her fingers and getting you know caught into the into the very things that she was trying to sew into a fabric of, of for somebody else uh, and I and I thought all of those it was just a very beautiful metaphor for all of that way that we carry our private self into our public life and and how we how we kind of like have to keep very careful uh, guard of all of those things because we can you know, at, at times, you know, and, and ultimately she like willingly gives it up, you know, she, she pull, she, you know, she, she lets him pull the ribbon off. And I, I, I very much want to think more about like, what are the parts of myself that are just for me and how to feel more okay with that as somebody who wants to uh, put a lot of myself into my work, uh, you know, and not leave very much, not on the table, you know, what, well, part of, of, of me of Reed can exist in, in that isolation. Uh, how, how about you? Do you, do you feel that it's hard to not, to not just put all of those things out when, when, when you're, when you're producing work? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think being a writer, you know, it's always kind of a duel between your private and public life. Um, you know, I think, I think the sort of like romance of, the you know individual writer genius who spends all day like writing and just like you know covertly putting work out there um and then it just like automatically gains traction and then it like and then it rises to popularity and then you um sustain yourself like being a private writer i think being a public figure is like a very much intentional effort but at the same time you know i am very protective about you know, my stories, especially, you know, with this new book, it's so, so, I mean, all work, all my work is autobiographical, but this is like, like, I think the way people can read it, like, could very easily, you know, like, recognize imprints of, you know, my life that I've shared in some way. And, and so, you know, it, but at the same time, I don't know how else to do it justice other than to name it but to name it under my terms and so i guess like my my version of a green ribbon is that i i like i think i think that that wearing it around the neck is like probably the most like up spot where i do feel at times like there is like this like tug on it and i just keep thinking like i don't i don't want to share in this way that you want me to um, mm-hmm. I just want you to trust me when I tell you, like, this is, this is like, how I want to go about it. Um, and there's a reason for it. You know, there's people whose um, lives are, you know, surrounding mine that I represent in this book. I want, you know, I want their experiences to have a certain amount of, like, I just want the dignity of their experiences to be recognized, too, knowing that. I think that especially for the way people read Asian American writers and and writers of color, you know, look, people tend to look for experiences that they can mine or tokenize or to say this is what an Asian American woman experiences. Um, And I just think that that would be so reductive. And I, I, I'm trying to, you know, actively refute that by allowing things to not be overly simplified or not to make it very difficult for someone to try Mm. to simplify it I think and I think I think that uh, this author also does a great job in refusing to simplify it by injecting so much great great humor she uh, humor uh, and and you all got you're astonishingly uh, astonishingly funny as well and I think I think those are the sort of like dynamics like uh, all of her references back to stories within stories was also very fascinating. Um, <laughs> whenever it would start, would start to get too deep, she would kind of just go like, "Well, anyway, that's enough of that," and and you would just be left going like, "Wait, what?" Uh, you know, in that in that way that I'm sure uh, it, it must. You know, I can only imagine just you know in my 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 small part of, of being a, a a marginalized person of sometimes it is it is like you said it's satisfying to not 
over satisfy the audience and not just like give them every single bit of meat off of the bone of what you're offering to them. Is there any part of the all of the different stories that she goes back to that what that resonated with you uh deeply because there were a few there were a few parts of this that I was just like oh man uh like the the part where the old woman uh her husband's mean and she's cooking the liver for him oh gosh that I don't know why that part just like got me for a second uh uh if if you if uh you know for just a spoiler alert if you haven't haven't read all of this story uh yeah she 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 harkens back to this this couple and the 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 only thing that she's able to to satisfy this guy with it is by cooking for him and one day he was like i want this liver and while she's cooking and and, and doing a beautiful job she gets hungry herself and she eats it and she goes all like, oh, fuck, what do I do? What do I do? She ends up like sne sneaking into a mortuary and cutting uh, a liver out of a cadaver, uh, feeding it to him. He's like, oh, best meal of my life. And then later that night while they're in bed, uh, the specter of the of the woman comes into the house and is like, who took my liver? And then uh, she suddenly realizes, you know, it, it comes like I'm spinning back to her that all of that was a like a fantasy that she actually like disemboweled herself in order to get her own liver out of her own body, fed it to her, you know, cooked it, fed it to her husband. He didn't even notice any of that. And he doesn't even notice as she's like bleeding out, you know, in, in her bed, you know, <laughs> and he's just like sleeping away. And, and then, and then it's just like, the story is over. And it just like, she's, she just goes on, you know, like a cresting wave onto the next uh, subject that she wants to approach. And I, uh, how, how, how do you feel about those sort of just like very abrupt, uh, moments of, of, uh, of, uh, I don't know, not necessarily violence, but of, of like, you know, these, these tragic figures, but it's also like darkly funny in certain ways. Cause she'll utilize it like an old fashioned ghost, you know, like she plays on the tropes of like bad horror <laughs> a lot too, in ways she, she so, the, so the, the, her own specter came in like, who ate my liver? <laughs> It's just so it's so fantastic. <laughs> it is, and it's like it's like um, I love that balance of like something so macabre and also like um, like affectively complicated. Where it's yeah, just like, yeah. am I supposed to laugh at this? Because it feels like there's something <laughs> that's like really terrifying. And I, I I love the inappropriateness of like okay, like I I like think like. I am laughing and also horrified because like it is such a familiar violence and there's like sometimes nothing you can do but to laugh because it's yeah so it, it becomes like looney tunes like you know if you actually think about literally like you know uh an anvil dropping onto an animal's head that's you know that's not funny that's horrifying but it, you know presented in the right tone presented with the right inflection you know affectation like you said it it, it could it could just like jar that catharsis out of you like a like you know like a like a popcorn kernel wedged out of your teeth suddenly <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, I think these stories like do that. Like, I mean, the story is already kind of has a um, meta impulse because it is like a a story based on a an original story, and then mm. there's all these stories within these other stories. It's almost like a Russian nesting doll set of like scary stories that are like a mixture of um, like you know, kind of like um, what they would call like old wives' tales. Um, things that have been passed on in various ways and and um you know and, and generally I think the stories are like uh you know fall into the category of these are warnings for women who you know you know fall out of line and so that was one of the stories of uh of just like you know you give I think the moral of it is just like sometimes you give so much of yourself like you don't realize like what does it take for you to finally realize that you've given too much you know and you know like and it's like the, the writing of it is so subtle i mean the, the story that there's like a one-line description of the husband which is that he's a terrifying man and mean man you know and um and that's it and that's all it takes for her to like um go to such extremes to provide for him and then her own desire um like is um you know like you know put on the back burner to the to the point where she doesn't even recognize that she um tore into her own body in order to satiate him and I think in many ways so many of us can um feel like a little bit of recognition in that experience too like how many times have we also done this in our lives you know um like like sacrifice ourselves 
not realizing that we've done that, but because like there's another person out there who holds a certain amount of power over us. And it doesn't even have to be like this, like this menacing power. Sometimes it's just power is just hovering, you know? Yeah. And I think it's like reading back and reflecting on the kind of relationships that I allow myself, I guess not even allow myself is the right word, but just I end up in where I'm already digging into myself and finding things to take out and offer up and realizing like it's just not sustaining to me anymore. So again, I think that's why whatever I do think about my my relationships like with people like you, it gives me so much more uh, of a heartening sort of feeling of knowing that I can have moments where not only are people not asking anything of me and not taking anything out of me and also trusting that I don't want anything like that from them either. Uh, it makes the days much more bearable. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think very fondly on our, our time of when you uh, still lived here in Los Angeles, us like going to Akbar, you know, dressing up to the nines just for ourselves and having cocktails and just glaring at all the men in the bar who <laughs> looked at us. <laughs> I mean, I was fine. I just remember going there with you. And then like anyone who said anything to me, you immediately just like, you know, verbal slap them to the face. So like, you know, <laughs> Well, yeah, mostly, I, I don't know, I, I'm just, you know, I, because I'm very defensive, of, you know, against the very, there's a very certain attitude that cisgender gay men have in those bars towards anyone that they read as a woman, because a lot of the time they uh, will, uh, in, like, initially assume that that, uh, that a, a woman is there is, is not gay, feeding off of that, you know, very real uh, frustration of, of straight people coming in and, and, and you know, you know, uh, rubber necking at us, but it gets to a point like, uh, did I ever tell you that my friend, my friend was at, was at that bar and, uh, she happened to bring a, like a bisexual couple, uh, and, uh, a gay man, uh, like an acquaintance of both of ours just walked up and was like, why did you bring them in here? And, and I think, so I think I am just very, uh, like, you know, I'm a little chihuahua to all of my friends, <laughs> especially all my women who come into those bars. Cause like, all of the lesbians are, are down in Long Beach, you know, the, the lesbian scene, you know, the, the queer femme scene, it's just like been decimated. And I think sometimes it's, it's like little bullies. <laughs> so I just bully them back preemptively. <laughs> I mean, that's true. Like all across, you know, these cities that do have like very prominent, um, like LGBTQ, like plus communities like I think there's generally like more spaces like as far as like nightlife goes you know, for like gay cis men, um, typically white, you know, and, yeah. and, and like, you know, lesbian bars, you know, are being closed down left and right, you know, and I felt that, you know, living in New York too. And, and in LA, there was just so few, there were just few opportunities, you know, to me to, to have queer spaces that are just like strictly for queer women. Um, yeah, like you have to be in drag if you want to be high femme and be in these bars and not feel a little bit interrogated sometimes. And I, I, I just have kind of lost my patience with it. Not that, you know, I've been in any of these places for like over a year, so I don't know. <laughs> but I do, I just always, I always feel just so empoweredly queer with you in a way that even though we are not like a, you know, romantically or sexually entangled with each other, I just, it's a, it's a, it's a confidence that I, you know, I cherish very much <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah. I think it just comes, I don't know. I mean, the way that I come, I, I and again, like my se sexuality is like, you know, really evolved like so much over the years. Or at least I will say like my understanding of my sexuality where, mm, me too. I, you, know, <laughs> have, you know, my relationship, with like you know cis men as someone who's queer you know some i mean i'm, I'm fine with the label of bisexual when it's like convenient and i do think it has a very complicated history that i'm still attached to but yeah. you know for the sake of you know reflecting the variety of like people like gender people that i've like you know been attracted to dated have relationships and have intimacy with you know it is it, it does span a spectrum and i think that I, for so long, when I've been with um, cis men who are primary partners or have been in monogamous relationships with them, I felt so self-conscious about my queerness. And I think it's just so different now, you know, I'm in, I'm in a, 
you know, in a relationship with, you know, a cis man of color and um, who's queer and, you know, there's still, uh, you know, recognition of like, um, hetero passing privilege and all those things that which even I so think true. I, I'm like I don't know I, but like even that stuff like it, it to a certain extent I'm like how how is that like you know not to tell you how to like label label your own stuff but I'm just like you know what's what's passing you know what privileges are you two necessarily gleaning off that are so profoundly that you know that we can call it like a passing sort of thing uh which is all already like a highly racialized term so I don't even like to use it in my own ter- you know my own uh the way that I describe anything myself too so I don't know I just feel like there's so much pressure on people who are not like you know who don't just identify as being attracted or or wanting to have these relationships with one one type of gender or one type of look of person I think it just gets so complicated to a point that just ends up be like how is this useful for you you know you you know you're one of the queerest people I can think of Muriel <laughs> in terms of how you yeah, you, you actually you like know. approach your life <laughs> how you li- how you live it you know like like you said how, how how can I do these things on my own terms how can I be presenting these things and I think that is the queerness to of everything you know in that academic sense of queer is like how how am I doing it on my own terms you know, with that material analysis of like, are, are these mores, are these rules and procedures and even, you know, what, what we call the, the uh, you know, how things look, you know, in, in a relationship. I, I think if you two are que- two queer people, you, there's a lot of pressure on you to even know what that means to yourself, you know, when you're together and apart. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, yeah. I mean, thank you for that. I think that it's, it's, I think I think as far as you know just just describing the experience of like walking down the street you know and I think it's just like also being like two cis people it's like definitely a different experience you know than when I was like with partners who are not cis you know and I and I think that there's there's something to that and at the mm-hmm. same time I like the joke that you know dating men is not a privilege <laughs> because have you met men <laughs> you know um so you know i i do like you know very much like lament the experiences of straight women who have like, no other options so very sorry for i'm so sorry wow. yeah yeah so no. Sorry. So sorry. no no to my to my lovely uh, uh sis, sis, sis straight friends out there praying for you no <laughs> <laughs> thoughts and prayers at the same time <laughs> Uh, Mariel, I, it's been it's been so lovely to be able to talk to you about about your work and about the work that we both love, and then just about the love that I have for you in general. Uh, I feel I feel again the very privileged to have had you on my on my show. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for having me. And that was my talk with poet Muriel Young. Oh, what a damn treat to get her perspective on literature, queerness, you know, all the good stuff. If you're in agreement, I urge you to go to Muriel's website. That's murielyoung.com, uh, M-U-R-I-E-L-L-E-U-N-G.com. And order that book, Imagine Us the Swarm. If you enjoyed this episode of Library Hours and want to stay tuned for the next episode, I highly recommend it because I have a double whammy of queer for you just in time for June Pride here in L.A. On June 8th, we're going to be getting all the ins and outs on the L.A. leather scene from Pup Star Orion, a leather pump champion. Yes, and on June 22nd, we're going to be speaking to It Girl and rising drag star Diana. Yes, one of my favorite queens. For more information, you can go to patreon.com backslash library hours with Reed Bryce. While there, if you decide to donate, I would appreciate that very much. You will get bonus content and know that all of the money that is raised by library hours is going to the mutual aid, solidarity and snacks. Yes, that's S-O-L-I-D-A-R-I-T-Y S-N-A-X on Twitter. If you want to reach out to them, they provide much needed food, water and goods to people living on Skid Row. So yeah, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe to our YouTube, follow us on Spotify, give us a review, uh, some feedback on iTunes, any way you want to reach out to me. I'm glad to hear from you. And uh, until next time, please take care of yourself, listener. You deserve it. Okay. Bye.